the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Okay, so who's introducing who? Which podcast are we on, Chris? Oh boy. Oh boy. I mean, I guess we're going to do a cross release here. Is that the plan? I think between the three of us, we've got like, you know, five podcasts, eight YouTube channels. So it'll, it'll emerge yeah. somewhere. <laughs> Welcome to the, the Titans of Decoupling or the oh, I love it. Titans. Titans of Decoupling. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, and yeah. Energy Decoupling Impact Titans. <laughs> I don't know some called. combination, some combination yeah. of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, no, um, I'm super excited to get a chance to, to, I mean, we chat all the time, but it's great to, great to record something again, especially with all your progress. I mean, I've just been watching in amazement. I mean, I always like just had so much admiration for what you've done with your first, your podcast, then your decouple studios. But now just to see this like political action that you've taken also, I'm just like sitting back watching in awe. So um, yeah, can't wait to hear, can't wait to hear all about it. Yeah, I mean, likewise, I've been dying to get you back on your your uh, anthropology of of nuclear was a very popular episode, and you definitely have uh, the uh, the heterodox ideas that I think are are needed to break through some of the how do we put it? I mean, there's just there's so much conservatism in the nuclear world. Um, the communications I find are are just so tightly cloistered. The idea of having an open debate and sharing some exciting ideas, I think, feels like the equivalent of a reactor meltdown to people within this <laughs> the sector. Um, so I think it's great having, you know, I, I very much consider myself an outsider. And, um, so, but we're, we've, we've definitely kind of come to this from, from an outsider perspective and, and both run these podcasts and talk to, you know, I just, it's hard to keep track of everybody, but they've all sort of left their, their little imprint on us and influenced our thinking. And, and that's been, I think, really good because coming as outsiders, we've, we've been able to incorporate a lot of, a lot of different ideas rather than being sort of subspecialized in, in a certain field or, or with a lens of, you know, we'll only be able to see things in, in one light. So. For sure. No, it's actually funny hearing you call me heterodox when like my main idea is let's just build what we've already always built. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, let's just build the normal reactors by main idea. It's so heterodox. It's pretty edgy, <laughs> pretty edgy Brett. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, cool. Well, yeah. So let um take me back to now. It's all blending together. You know what has been going over publicly versus you know what you and I just chat about. But kind of take me back to some of the like recent political action that has occurred. I mean, actually, I'm going to make you tell a little bit of the story, even though I've heard you speak about it publicly. But tell me a little bit of the story when you approach that person at or the German guy at COP. Did that kind of kick off a little bit of your like uh, political antagonism? No, no, we have to go like way further back into the past for that. Um, you know, I think, you know, at COP, probably the, the big bang moment was uh, this interview, a bit of a ambush interview with our uh, famously anti-nuclear uh, environment minister, uh, Mr. Stephen Gilbo, um, who spent 10 years, I think, uh, working within Greenpeace, 10 years within a, uh, a Canadian environmental group that he started. Uh, he repelled off of the CN Tower, which was once the tallest tower in the world, um, to bring attention to climate change. I think he got released on fifty thousand dollars bail. Like he's like a legit, legit green activist, um, and he was brought in uh, to our current government uh, to signal that they were serious about climate change. Um, and anyway, we had this this moment, and and it's just the product of you know so much of you know you mentioned the growth of the podcast, a couple studios. Uh, being able to bring people on board on this journey has been absolutely incredible. And so, you know, this great friend of mine, Jesse Freeston, who's a very talented filmmaker, videographer, uh, video journalist, um, was at COP and we kept, caught this moment. And, you know, I think it's probably a little bit um, generous to say it went, it went viral, but we got, you know, I think over 10,000 views of this interaction with this minister where I just said, you know, is your anti-nuclear past going to cloud your judgment as minister? You know, is that going to mean that you will uh, ignore really the scientific consensus where the IPCC is saying that 
know, nuclear needs to increase in, in all four of our illustrative decarbonization pathways. And he dodged the question, you know, no, it's not up to the market. Sorry, it's not up to the government. Markets will decide. And then five months later, um, he uh, releases this green bond framework um, saying that uh, nuclear is essentially a sin stock. It's, uh, it's gambling, it's tobacco, How? it's firearms, it's smoking. How? How is that still possible? I remember that being like nuclear being clustered with, you know, tobacco firearms like 10 years ago in the, um, you know, however they categorize these things, or maybe even yeah. more, I don't know, I wasn't around, but like when looking at it, like, okay, it was like stuck in the UN or classification or some EU classification that says, how is this still going on today? This is crazy. Yeah, it's starting to change. It's starting to change. And that's what I've, I've sort of been giving the government hell on uh, the ruling party is, um, you know, their justification for this uh, exclusion. And, and the lumping in with the sin stocks is, uh, you know, well, this is just, we're basing it on best practice in terms of green finance. Of course, they're ignoring the EU sustainable uh, finance taxonomy, which may be fair play. I think it's the final vote is in May when it will be kind of written into law. Um, but apparently the, uh, the French green bond doesn't include nuclear. The Ontario green bond, my province, which is 62% powered by nuclear, does not include nuclear. Um, that's all changing. That's all changing soon. But in terms of these these changes, um, you know, we have Bruce Power, um, the world's largest operating nuclear plant, which is run on a private private public uh, partnership. Um, they issued a, a green bond worth 500 million that was oversubscribed six times. So we know that if you include it, capital will come. And we know that when you actually expose it to scientific investigation, as was done, you know, with the EU Sustainable Finance Tax on with the Joint Research Commission, we know that it gets included. Um, so the argument here in Canada has really been, you know. Let's let's lead on this, uh, not make excuses. Um, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into more details of sort of the some of the conversations I had. But you know, the real the real surprise for me is that I got into this advocacy work about three years ago. Um, in 2019, we, we held our first stand up for nuclear event, um, Nathan Phillips Square. It's one of the the main public squares in Toronto. Um, you know, we were there illegally because we didn't reserve the square. We just brought some folding tables, um, literally like, you know, hand-drawn posters. I, I, I'm a pretty shitty graphic designer, but I made some pamphlets and crammed on way too much information and graphs from various places and, you know, talk to passers-by, talk to homeless people, talk to, you know, mentally ill, uh, people up on their milk cartons, um, you know, preaching their version of the gospel, just talk to anybody. And then, yeah, three years later, um, in the uh, West Block, in the House of Parliament, talking with cabinet ministers, senators, making presentations to the caucuses of the two, uh, you know, the, the two natural parties of government. We have four parties in Canada, but two are the ones that always form government. And it's, it's just been a dizzying ride. Um, yeah, so and I can't, did, I can't quite explain it. But yeah, I mean, you just yada, yada, yada over some, a lot of stuff that happened there. So, so what was the moment that you started being treated as an authority amongst um these 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 political uh these political i don't even want to call them elites but like just just these political people like the government people when did they start coming to you and saying hey chris you clearly know what you're talking about it's it's yeah i'm, I'm trying to put a pin in that spot um you know it's been very interesting doing the podcast um you know which i, I speak to philosophers i speak to engineers i speak to activists and advocates ultimately i'm goal driven um it just happens to be that nuclear ticks the most boxes that i'm after in terms of you know climate concern biodiversity um you know uh, maintaining industrial capacity in the west uh just transition that it just co coincides with ticking a lot of boxes but um you know i try and i try and maintain a sort of um you know challenge my cognitive dissonance be open uh but i you know i am also a player i'm i'm an advocate i i i I feel like um, I need to put my convictions into action. Um, and so that process, again, began with these, these kind of stand up for nuclear events. Um, but we have some very interesting uh, tools available to us. And, and I talk about this sometimes, right? This, this idea of a, a David and Goliath on a battle of ideas, right? There, are, there, there is a, an, an ideological battle of ideas happening. Um, and right now, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of between big green NGOs um, the kind of what I'll call the eco romantics, um, and you know the people who subscribe to that pseudo religious narrative of you know we've sinned against Mother Earth by industrializing it to go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, and then we have, for lack of a better term, maybe Team Eco Modern, Team Innovation, which says no, I mean we are problem solvers. Humans are incredible. We're constantly solving problems and creating new ones for ourselves. Um, we do not have the luxury of hitting the rewind button 
um, we need to continue to innovate. And, you know, whether that's with on the energy front with with nuclear, you know, moving up the energy density ladder, moving up the energy return, energy invested ladder, um, whether it's uh, with agricultural tools across the board. I mean, we face some of the greatest challenges, uh, you know, of our time. Um, and we have one set of ideas, which is saying we should just abandon what we do best, which is think, innovate, you know, invent. Um, but, but in terms of that David and Goliath setting, I don't have the numbers, you know, for Canada, I think I have a better sense of the US, you have about a billion dollars of annual operating revenue for groups like the Sierra Club, Natural Resource Defense Council, wow. Friends of the Earth, and others. Um, and in terms of that sort of team eco modern, whatever that is, you know, in terms of think tanks that are actually advocating on, on that file, I'd be surprised if it's more than 10 million. Yeah, you know, so you have a several orders of magnitude difference. And and sort of sallying force on onto that battleground is an interesting thing. And so for me, I'm always looking at, you know, what's the, how can I get sort of greatest return on, on energy and on, on sort of my activist energy invested. And a lot of it is, well, don't reinvent the wheel, like see, see what the antis are up to. Right. Um, and so that led me a couple of years ago to, to looking at what Sierra club Canada was up to. And they, they had this mechanism. It's, it's a house of commons petition. It's, I think it's a commonwealth thing. So all, all the sort of uh, countries colonized by, uh, by England. Um, if you get a sufficient number of signatures in a sponsoring MP, um, your petition is read on the floor of the House of Commons, and it mandates a written response from government. Wow. And that's cool. That's a very yeah. neat democratic mechanism. Yeah, that's democracy. Nice. It really is. It really is. Um, and so I've just been sort of seeing, okay, what are the antis up to? Oh, what's this? Oh, there's this petition. Oh, I didn't know about that. Now, these are groups that have, um, you know, a historical legacy. They have an institutional memory. They've been exploring what are the best advocacy tools. What are these little, um, you know, what in video games, these little uh, cheats, or what do you call it? Level up secrets. Cheat codes or something. I don't know. Yeah. Cheat codes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was probably the, the the way that I sort of got introduced into the political process. I got a, you know, my local MP again, sponsored that petition and, and that went somewhere. Um, and then the other thing is um, I moved into a, another uh, another writing not too long ago. And uh, it was actually uh, a decouple listener um, who's involved a lot in, in local politics started talking my MP's ear off um, about what she was hearing about on decouple. Yeah. Um, so wow. apparently that led to him saying, hey, I got to reach out to him. And we started talking and, you know, this is not a nuclear writing. If anything, this is more of an environmental NGO type writing. So I, I have to give uh, this uh, MP, Ari Ferrani, a lot of credit um, because I think he's really acting in a principled manner and, and you know, listening, studying the issue, um, and maybe even risking his political skin slightly in this, in terms of his writing. Um, but I think he he's someone who believes in, in in science and following the best evidence and listening to expertise. Pretty amazing. I'm giving a way too long of an answer here, but no, no, yeah. no. I'm in, I'm enjoying listening to it. No, it's like a masterclass kind of you know because like you know I like I say what we do is advocacy, but really what you know I focus most of our attention on is is really just is really just trying to learn and just trying to like see what needs to be done and then as a byproduct you know we do advocacy uh mm -hmm. but we haven't you know really ever tried to optimize i haven't like thought about it like you like what are the tools at our disposal um so no so it's pretty amazing to watch what you're doing and also you know a lot of our friends you know like mark nelson and and the others mm -hmm. like to just kind of watch how everyone is is really doing advocacy. I almost think like what I'm doing is like fake advocacy. You know, like I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to make a difference and I'm trying to, and then like, I, I like I'm giving away my journey, you know, to everybody, right. also, but it's, it's like a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely your, your podcast was out before mine. I remember uh, you're one of the, one of the inspirations for, for, you know, me jumping into the, the, the host seat. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So yeah. So tell me more, tell me more about the, the, the political discourse in, in Canada and just what you've seen change over the last year and where maybe you've changed your own mind on how to approach things over the last year as well. Right. Right. I mean, in terms of this whole nuclear advocacy thing, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, how to, how to build a base. Um, because I think within politics, um, you know, there's voting blocks, which politicians will respect. Um, there's, you know, the number of signatures you can mobilize on a petition, the number of letters you can get sent to a, a parliamentarian, for instance. Um, but also just in terms of, again, of a battle of ideas, um, if you are able to build a critical mass of people who really believe in something that becomes, it, it develops a sort of magnetism and it, it's able to draw in others. It's able to normalize. It's able to send signals. I think a lot about, 
um, you know, why we hold the beliefs that we do. Um, and especially early on in decouple, we engaged a lot with these ideas um, around sort of, you know, tribalism. We see it a lot with COVID now, right? In terms of people hold beliefs that they really haven't investigated deeply out of out of a tribal identity. And I think, you know, tools like Twitter tend to really uh, hyper hyper polarize us and put us even more into those, yeah, tend to those camps. Yeah, it or ossify some of these beliefs, yeah. Right, but how do we change, how do we change, um, you know, beliefs that just kind of, emerge from our, our context, our political context, our class context, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of it is, um, I think just paleo psychology, right? It's, um, it's, you know, how, how did we in the old days uh, in our evolutionary history, how did we develop ideas and change positions? And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, this kind of culture of influencers right now. And, you know, maximum respect to folks like Isabel Bemeke and others who are signaling, you know, and, and I think she's having huge impacts in terms of bringing along, uh, um, Oh God, what's Elon's ex's name again? Um, blank, blanking on the name right now, but oh, yeah, you know, the singer, the singer. she's yeah. making it safe for Grimes. She's making it safe for Grimes and others to sort of come forward and normalize it. Um, but in terms of you know political advocacy um, and and really mobilizing a movement, um, I was looking around and I was like, well, who 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 do I talk to, right? Because I think within within uh, nuclear advocacy, there's a tendency to want to just argue with the people who are yelling at you the loudest and that's a that's a almost always a massive mistake i mean there's yeah I think sometimes they're early... sometimes they're people who have actually have beliefs that are pretty close to yours also is that interesting kind of like in, in religion sometimes too it's like when you see like slight variations in christianity oh God, slight yeah. variations in islam and they're the ones attacking each They'll other kill each other over it yeah but sometimes even in like the like environmental advocacy space okay you see environmentalists going after each other even within the nuclear advocacy space you see some oh, other so it's like what's going on there that's some part yeah. of natural human psychology too right oh definitely definitely yeah yeah no i mean don't don't get me started on the i, I think in one of my episodes with with michael schellenberger I, I revealed this kind of taxonomy of of uh of nuclear, which uh, which he quite liked, but <laughs> I don't want to stick my toes in the factional waters again. <laughs> um, but uh, I think I lost my train of thought there. Um, in in terms of um, in terms you, of that, you say you making know, it safe. Um, new voices are coming out, making it safe for yeah, and, and like and how to how to build how to build a movement um, in needing that critical mass. And so certainly we're lucky within Canada. I mean, I've talked to allies in in Australia, for instance, and they're just starting you know, nuclear is illegal there, you know, they make some isotopes, but they don't, they don't have like a sector or an industry or, or people involved in it. And so from day one, um, I've really been assessing, well, who are the actors at play here? Is it, is it, you know, my fellow environmentalists, is it the Green Party? You know, and I engaged for a while there and I should certainly like, it's like a whetstone kind of sharpening the edge of your blade. You have to, they keep you on your toes because you have to look up absolutely every bizarre um, myth or dogma that they have and, and dispel it. But, but, yeah. but are they, are they sort of that block that you are going to be able to mobilize and create a movement with? No, I mean, they bark loudly. So there's a tendency, especially with the social media thing, just to like, well, let's, let's just argue with that, but they, they become kind of like a vampire that can really eat up a lot of your time, which could be used much more yeah. productively to make change in the world. Yeah. And, and so for me, it was, you know, I need to, there's, there's 76,000 people working within the sector and there are people who I consider to be, you know, clean air, climate, medical isotope heroes. Um, so let's figure out a way to to meet them where they're at, interact with them, um, and see if I see if we can mobilize them, get them politically active, get them signing petitions, getting them writing letters, getting them coming to rallies. And that's been the secret sauce here in terms of, you know, you're asking sort of when the rubber hit the road. Um, it was really this the second petition that we did on the green bond, um, which you know, in that interim year, I'd spent uh, just relationship building right across the sector, but mostly with, uh, with unions and workers. Um, and so, you know, when we developed this petition, we were able to send it out to a number of email listservs that hit probably 70,000 people in total. Wow. And so we got 10,000 signatures, you know, some of those are coming certainly from outside the sector, but a lot of those are just everyday working men and women in the nuclear sector who are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you're, you're calling me a, the moral equivalent of, of working in gambling. Like I make the medical isotopes that enable yeah. modern healthcare that sterilize 40% of the world's, you know, single use medical devices. And you're, you're saying I'm the equivalent of a tobacco manufacturer. Yeah. You know? And you went over that pretty quickly. So I'm just going to like slow that down for a second for the audience, that, that whole sure. part about making the um, sterilizing the medical equipment, because yeah. it, it is a pretty powerful argument. The thing that people are so People that are, the thing that people are so worried about radiation, which, you know, they, maybe they don't understand, but 
okay, they're concerned and probably rightfully concerned just because like, it's not their fault that just because this is how society has like characterized this thing. But either way, this thing radiation is used so effectively um, for health, you know, across a, a variety of, of, of tools yeah. of medicine. But the one you were just talking about is sterilizing medical equipment. And once again, you said pretty fast, so I want to like just slow down around it. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it one, you're saying it's like one facility in Canada does most of the world's sterilization or what, what was it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this wonderful feature of, uh, you know, a pressurized heavy reactor, uh, water, or sorry, pressurized heavy water reactor system like the CANDU that we have. Um, so between Bruce and Pickering, um, we produced um, the majority of the world's cobalt 60, which is a absolutely vital gamma source uh, for, for sterilizing, um, you know, a whole number of things, but, you know, 40% of the world's single use medical devices are sterilized with cobalt 60 from our, our facilities, you know, in Ontario. Um, and, you know, there are, there are, um, you know, other means of making isotopes, but different isotopes require different environments and to produce at scale. There's nothing better than it can do for that. Yeah. So um, and, you know, and, and it, you know, I'm, I work in healthcare, right? This is my bread yeah. and butter. Um, and I was talking with, uh, you know, someone from the medical isotopes body here in Canada and, and it just really hit home for me, you know, like that, that IV cannula that I'm putting in that patient, that, that endotracheal breathing tube that's going in that patient, um, that artificial hip joint that's going in that patient, these things are all made possible, um, by, by medical isotopes. And, you know, there, there is, you can autoclave, you can use high temperature steam and things like that, but a lot of things will melt if you try and do that to them. You know, we use a lot of plastics in medicine and that's kind of what's made medicine um, so accessible and so kind of mass mass producible. Um, you know, and then on an even more personal note, uh, my dad is currently getting a cancer treatment, uh, lutetium-177, um, which they're scaling up at Bruce right now. Wow. So there's just like, it, things got really personal for me pretty fast with these things. And you, you've heard studies like uh, Dr. James Edward Hansen did a study looking at um, you know, making an estimate based on air pollution uh, statistics, you know, how many people have been saved as a result of nuclear energy, and they estimated, I think, 1.8 million lives. But if you were to think about, you know, the consequences of a lack of sterility in healthcare environments, um, you know, and Billions. then also, if you want to think about cancer yeah. treatments with, with radiation, I mean, it's, it's billions, uh, Bill billions, yeah. billions, billions. So I just don't understand why we can't. Well, I mean, this is just going to be sound like complaining, but I'll, I'll take my privilege. Like, I find it you know, pretty disturbing the way that the nuclear industry historically has has handled communication. There's such an amazing story to tell there about yes. the clean air, the medical tools, um, and and rebranding nuclear. Like keep the word nuclear, but just like you know, surround it with with all the, with all this positivity. Yeah. But the the habit that we fall, so often fall back onto. And I, I almost call, I'll, I'll call you out. I, you know, I, I, I almost, you know, I've almost caught you doing it a little bit of times and me too, by the way, I'm calling myself out also. It, it falling back into the, like the defensive, the defensive rhythm where it's like, okay, so here's this myth. Let me dispel this myth. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we don't do it right, I know like we're collaborating on trying to figure out how to do that a little bit better, but it's a weakness of mine too, falling, falling into the, like the defensive nature. Um, and, and I just feel like that doesn't send the right, because like people aren't going to be, con I, I, listen, I don't actually think people are ever convinced by facts. I think people are convinced by emotional arguments mm -hmm. uh, or like if, if someone wants to be convinced by facts, they'll be convinced by facts. But if someone comes from like a totally different place, they're going to be convinced by emotional arguments more than emotional arguments. And also, and also, you know, again, we look to leadership, right? We look to thought leaders like within medicine. I mean, I can't study and look at, you know, critically appraise all of the emerging epidemiologic evidence about the various treatments that are out there. Right. I'm trained to do so. And I can do that for, you know, a small area of, of you know, practice that's that's within my scope, emergency medicine. Um, but I, I very much rely on on thought leaders, um, people who I know have excellent values, integrity. Uh, morality, um, who are better at it or spend a greater percent of their professional life doing it. Um, and I have to, you know, I'll read what they write, their summaries of the literature. And I'll say, yeah, that makes sense to me. You know, I, I don't have the time to digest all of the primary literature to arrive at every conclusion I have. So we do, you know, with this fact thing, a lot of it is, you know, is this, a, is this a, is this an influencer? Is this a leader who, who has the kind of ethics yeah. and integrity? And am I going to base a little bit of my comfort with this in, 
in what I see them embracing or, or thinking about. Yeah. Okay, such a good point. But this is then a huge weakness of the nuclear industry because if you look around at the thought leaders, the the expert scientific minds, like especially when it comes to a topic of waste, like what do they do? They oh, say we God. need to spend billions of dollars um, storing it deep underground, you know, devoting our national labs attention to, to solving the issue. And therefore they reinforce this underlying the falsehood that nuclear waste is like a hazard, like it's like this dangerous hazard that we have to deal with. It's right? unbelievable. These, it's unbelievable. These are the experts. The experts are the experts in the nuclear industry, many of which I know, by the way, and, and are good people and I like them, but they like they'll fall into these political positions or they'll fall into these like national lab positions. This is how they're going to get grant money. And so they go around, um, you know, reinforcing this lie that nuclear waste is a hazard. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So like, what, what are we going to do about I mean, that? I mean, I, I talked to someone recently about this um, and I was asking, it was a Canadian focused uh, episode. We haven't published it yet. We might have to re-record it because of a sound quality issue. Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the great tragedies of podcasting is occasionally having an issue like that. But, um, you know, based upon the Postiva study of the, the Finnish repository, right, where they're looking at, okay, worst case scenario, all of the engineered barriers break down in a thousand years, which is, you know, <laughs> way before they could ever probably do so. Um, you know, what, what's the worst case scenario to someone living in the most contaminated spot, quote unquote, contaminated eating food grown only in the most contaminated spot, drinking water from the most contaminated spot. And it was an excess dose equivalent to two extra bananas per year. So crazy. Right? And so the question, the question, I mean, that's even a whole hypothetical scenario, right. Of, of, you know, things breaking down in a thousand years, but you know, I was like, well, what's, what could you do for four banana dose per year at a thousand years into the worst case scenario? What, what's the added cost to getting it down to two bananas? Like yeah. even in this ridiculous scenario, that's not realistic where everything fails, you know, and, and it's like, we're building a Fort Knox out of gold bricks itself to yeah. put this stuff. And you know, it, it is, there is a hazard, but we, we know how to manage that hazard. We know how to shield it. And that's why there's not been any deaths associated with, with stored civilian yeah. nuclear waste. And so like my, my question for him was, okay, so you want to spend $26 billion on this deep geologic repository. To me, that seems like a huge misallocation of societal resources. If you can do it for 2 billion, right? Then what can you send every, I know, high school age kid in Canada who wants to go to university to school to get a higher yeah. education? Like, yeah. what can you, like, we are burying, we're or, just shoveling. Or in America, where we don't even have like guaranteed bills. healthcare for like kids. Like, can we just get some kids some healthcare? You know, right. it's like. Right. But instead, it's, yeah. And, and, and for me, again, it all comes back to this key point. And James Conca hits on this a lot around nuclear waste, which is that it's, you, you find the best geology and the geology is the barrier. And, you know, We've but, got the whip, which, is, which I, has got even crazier stats. But but in Ontario, the rock we're looking at takes a million years for water to move a meter. The water has to get through all those engineered barriers, dissolve a ceramic fuel pellet in an anoxic environment. You know that water needs to you know dissolve dissolve it, carry those radioisotopes. And if that water takes a million years to move a meter, you're done. Yeah. You know we're 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 thinking about waste on a on a civilizational time scale, which can be scary. But we're not keeping it on the surface in canisters. We're putting it in a geologic formation, and we're looking at geological time scales. And we like we've made a mountain out of a molehill. But I'll I'll still push back. Um, and I know I've diverted the conversation a little bit, but this is something I want to talk to you about anyway. I think it's a fun discussion yeah, for sure. about publicly. I'm still going to push back on this idea that it's a hazard. I, I'm mm -hmm. willing to admit it's toxic. But like so, like the, mm -hmm. the kitchen table in front of me right now, like I, I like I treated those shelves up there. Like the chemicals that I treated them with are toxic. And, and we feel comfortable throwing them in a landfill because we're not worried about people like going onto a landfill and like and like shoving the chemicals into their mouth. And that's also what Licking you need your, to yeah. do if it was with nuclear waste too. Like, like you would need to eat it. Like you would need yeah. to walk up to a pile of nuclear waste somewhere and just eat it. I, I don't even care if the what geology it is if you just throw it in any landfill and just pile some dirt on top of it it is not <laughs> going to be a hazard period end of story just like we do with like all of the the toxic the toxic chemicals that that don't have a half-life that last infinity long like we just throw them in a landfill and we assume people aren't going to walk up to it and shove it in their mouths and that's good enough mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you, I can always trust you to, to kind of push it a little further down the road, right? Uh, but. I do. My, like my middle name is a shift the Overton window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I feel you. I feel you. You know, you, were, you said something that struck me earlier, which is, you know, just the, the failure of imagination within, within the sort of nuclear sector's communications. And, you know, this was something that I came up with for our most recent petition. Um, because we're, we're talking again about this whole sector uh, being left out of 
out of the green bond framework. And, you know, part of this, this podcast, the beauty of this journey is, you know, I'm not an economist. I have a very, very poor understanding of economics, but I'm able to have cultivated some relationships now. And I basically have a special economics advisor that I can send a text to at two in the morning. And usually he gets back to me and can explain complex stuff to me. And, you know, because economics is a weakness of mine, I've had him on about eight times now, (laughs) but, you know, understanding the way in which we've built our civilizational infrastructure, like that, which makes us a modern advanced society um, is that infrastructure. And we've talked about that on the podcast with this, this whole kind of getting very, um, very back to basics or first principles of, you know, these restored energy, energy conversions, you know, the bridges, the sewers, the roads, um, the, the water systems, the power plants, et cetera. Um, But they were really financed and built with bonds. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this, the idea of leaving nuclear out of a bond at a time when you're, if you're taking climate change, seriously, going to need to do a generational um, undertaking, you know, a war mobilization type undertaking to build new infrastructure, cutting it cutting the most effective tool for for that uh, action out of out of your bond financing um, is a big problem so i was generating some arguments around this and i was you know in canada we have the oil sands which are sort of our climate bet noir um you know it's it's a bitumen that we have to inject high temperature steam to to loosen up we have to just dig up the sand and it, it's it, it's not a great eroei source um and it's only viable when oil's at I think 70, 70 bucks a barrel or something like that. But all that to say, that's kind of the, the dark sort of side of our climate impact in Canada. And that's why as an OECD country, our emissions have really not done much. You know, the oil sands went up, our, our nuclear powered coal phase in Ontario brought, uh, brought emissions down on one side of the country as the oil sands went up. And so we've sort of held it level thanks to nuclear um, largely. But I wanted to look at you know, what's, what's kind of the opposite of the oil sands in terms of a, uh, a resource extraction program that is displacing emissions or reducing emissions and i i I was like well let's let's look at the uh canadian uranium sector yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and so globally the the nuclear fleet offsets two gigatons of co2 per year you know for reference all of humanity puts out 50 gigatons per year 50 is a really good number to know so two is offset by nuclear with the paltry amount that we do we should do so much more but canada's contribution to that the most recent numbers i could find from 2013 are about 13 percent and so we offset domestically and internationally 260 megatons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that happens to be one third of our annual national emissions as a, as a, you know, a pretty heavy polluter from a carbon p- p- position relative to our population, Canada, we're a smallish country. So one, we offset one third of our annual national emissions with our uranium sector, yet so much of this sort of financial game of carbon offsets is, well, I won't cut down this forest. Um, so I, I'm going to offer you some, some carbon trading credits. Uh, oh, shit, climate change. And it burned down because uh, we didn't manage the forest well or whatever, because, because of the forest fires. There goes the carbon, right? But we have a physical asset that's like, you know, that has a demonstrated ongoing track record of, of decarbonization. And we don't recognize it as a country. And, and, and the sector that does it, didn't do that math. It was some random doctor who's become a podcaster, who's become obsessed with energy and climate change, uh, who's who's doing these numbers on the back of an envelope, writing a petition. Like it's it's a we live in a strange world. Yeah, I want to come back to the bonds for a second to understand what you, um, you distinguish between the one that was successful and the one that's not being categorized appropriately by the government. But before we get right. there, I just wanted to uh, just hone in on a little bit of that math. Um, so that's like twenty five times. All we need to do is produce 25 times as much nuclear to totally negate everything else, right? And so to me, I'm thinking, okay, so everywhere that you see a nuclear plant, and this is for all of energy, not just electricity, if you just built 25 buildings there, and by the way, there's only 450 such places, you know, okay, so build 25 buildings, which does not seem like an astronomical number of buildings. Like if anyone goes to any city that's doing some construction, like even just like DC, I can see 25 cranes on the skyline mm-hmm. easily. I, you know, I'm sure in cities in Canada, it's the same way. Um, 25 buildings, you see a nuclear plant, build 25 buildings, boom. We have totally eliminated all carbon emissions on planet Earth. Now granted I'm simplifying, but like that's a good way to like visualize that it actually doesn't take that much stuff when you're using nuclear to displace all emissions. It's bonkers. Yeah. I mean, and, and some emissions, of course, are not, not displaceable even. Right. With exactly. Some exactly and electricity, bit. but yeah, I mean, conceptually, that's, a, that's a very interesting thought exercise. I hadn't done it myself. Um, so let's come back to that, that bond framework again. Just help me understand. Mm-hmm. So if there was this one green bond that was pub, that was made 
by a public, uh, not public, a private entity or pseudo public private entity. And it was five times oversubscribed. I'm playing a little devil's advocate here. Why do we need government to create a green bronze framework that includes nuclear? Why can't just companies just do it? I mean, companies can, and, and Bruce Power did. They, they consulted with a, um, a sustainable finance consulting firm or a bank that approved them that kind of said, yes, you are virtuous enough, but they didn't get the deep green. They got a light green rating. Oh, I didn't realize. Meant, oh, there's Yeah, sh- which green? meant a, a uh, <laughs> higher a higher interest rate on the capital that was borrowed. Wind and is solar it- is, 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 you know, the, the I maybe I'm forgetting which kind of greens, but wind and solar is the ultimate green, right? And so they, they qualify for the lowest, uh, <laughs> this is, this is like lowest soft- cost capital. This is like soft core porn for the environmentalists, like 50 shades of green. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, there, there is a route there, um, which is exciting for sure within, within the private side. Um, I mean, governments are, have a reputation earned or not um, for being, you know, reliable in terms of paying back their debts, being able yeah. to, to finance those debts. And so they're able to, able to offer, you know, a triple A rated bond. Um, which gets you basically the lowest interest rate. And, and for me, it's really relevant because you look at what well, can the private sector just do this? Well, I mean, EDF, um, which is a government associated company, obviously, um, and owns the, US, the, the UK nuclear fleet. I mean, Hinkley Point, apparently two thirds of the cost of that project is the cost of capital, which I believe is nine or 10% interest rates. For, you know, yeah, if, if, they, if they could be doing it for two, 2.2, 2.5, yeah. what does that do to the cost of that nuclear plant? You know, and, and with cost being such a concern in this day and age, um, for me, and, and especially learning like, well, again, bonds built our country, they built our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're on a we're on this, you know, this in Canada, the numbers are, are, are really staggering. Um, you know, in order to just double the size of our electricity grid, which wouldn't get us all the way there, but would do, you know, put a dent into transportation and buildings, you know, heating, that sort of stuff. Uh, we need to double it, and it's the equivalent of building uh, 96 new large candy reactors. We built 24 in the history of the country, and we built 20 in Ontario in 20 years. And that wasn't with the imperative of like, shit, we need to build for a climate. Yeah, yeah. It was a more practical reason, shit, we need to build so we don't have blackouts because of a lack of generating capacity. Uh, but it was it was bonds that financed those sorts of things. So I didn't have an appreciation for the importance of, of bonds. And I mean, this, this green bond that the government's issuing is only for $5 billion dollars. Um, it's their first offering. Uh, it was oversubscribed two times, not not the uh, six times that Bruce was. Um, but uh, you know, it, they're they're saying that it's going to be ten billion, you know, year after year after year, probably going forward. And so, just vital that that nuclear is on there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to you know yak a bit more about you know how how that that sort of advocacy went. But I, you know, it just it brought home to me, you know when you're talking about, okay, let's build 25 more of those buildings in every site. Well, how, how the hell do we pay for it? How do we mobilize the capital to do that? And I mean, if I'm, I'm not well-versed in this, if you have stuff to add here more from the sort of private side, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, there's certainly political, you know, political parties that say, Hey, we're a no new spending candidate here. Um, tell us how to do this without, without spending any public money. I don't have an answer for that, but if, if you do, I'd love to hear it. No, I mean, listen, I think bonds are a great mechanism. I think that they, uh, you know, properly align incentives. A lot of these government bonds, you know, are crafted with like long-term investment thinking in mind. And that's something that nuclear mm-hmm. happens to play well into. You put a lot of money up front, but then it pays back, you know, really well over a very long period. I mean, these are assets that last a long time. Um, yeah. so you get the steady, um, the steady pay, payback stream over that period of time. So yeah, no, but I think, yeah, private, private capital, public capital. Uh, yeah, I think we can put it all to work. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for yeah, investing yeah. in more nuclear. It only, it only yeah. makes sense um, if we can get the construction period down. If we can get the costs per plant down, I think that um, I think that market forces, you know, will take over and make it the, the dominant energy source. Uh, but uh, you know, a, a cheaper cost of capital is one way to you know create that that cycle of you know, ever reducing costs as you build more and more of the same thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the petition um, really took off, as I was saying, this whole concept of building a, a block, um, building a critical mass uh, without <laughs> abusing the, uh, no, keep, the metaphors too much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it happens accidentally now. And usually I'm a, when I say no pun intended, I really have to think through a pun and it is always intended. So when they happen accidentally, it's great. Uh, but anyway, um, 
yeah, we got, we got a lot of signatures on this petition. And, and, you know, again, I think there's just been a sea change in attitudes towards nuclear um, that I've seen since I became interested in it and started reading in, in, into it about probably 2017, 2018. Um, and, you know, it's, it's practicalities that I think make, make nuclear really thrive and things like energy crises, skyrocketing fossil fuel prices, um, you know, geopolitical um Political thunderstorms circle. right yeah, I mean, no, o- opec it, opec crisis right i mean obviously there's nuclear going before the opec crisis but that was a serious okay let's let's put the pedal to the metal here particularly for net importers of fossil fuels like france or island nations uh etc so um it's it's only natural and i mean I, I do find this quite ironic that you know when fossil fuel prices or when energy prices are high um all of a sudden there's big trouble in renewables land um and and there's a renaissance there's a renaissance for nuclear and when fossil fuel prices are rock bottom as they've been since the sort of fracking revolution um it was you know it was renewables time so it's 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 interesting it's it's so true it almost makes me question like is does what we do even like are we actually creating change or are we actually a product of change that was already occurring like has there been an opportunity for us to you know find a voice in the nuclear industry because the tides were already turning there was already like <laughs> instability in the power markets over these last few years that drove us to the sector or that drove interest right. in the sector including us we didn't even realize that we were all just like part of this thing that was going to happen in any way and then right. like things just keep on culminating you know it's like um you know the increase of renewables leads to energy instability leads to higher prices maybe even leads to you know Putin, you know, seeing an opportunity and then, you know, like all, like maybe it's all, maybe it was all fated to happen. <laughs> We're just along for the ride. I think in, in a lot of ways, that's true. I mean, you know, the sort of like great man theory of history is, is, you know, I think pretty patently easy to poke holes in, especially when you're like become an energy determinist like you and I do. Um, you know, there's, but there's certainly a role for, for, uh, you know, the personalities that come along these kind of accidents of history to to rise up and and be and i wouldn't i wouldn't give it up for the world i mean this has been i don't yeah. know this has just been such a fun it's you know can be stressful times totally. but i think just but there, there is there is a, i think it's milton friedman if i'm getting it right um and i think that's actually where i'm borrowing this battle of ideas um framing from but um you know i think he talks a lot about when a crisis presents itself uh, all of a sudden, it's like there's a bunch of sheets of paper on the ground, and policymakers are you know, running around with their, you know, their tails up and and just grabbing at what's there and picking up ideas. Um, and so it's been vital, you know, when, when times were hard, that there were folks like yourself uh, or like myself that are that are putting these ideas out there, making them available, um, so that people go, "Shit, crisis! What are some good ideas? What can we do?" Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what's been really, really exciting um, for for my organization, Canadians for Nuclear Energy. You know, we're a group of all there's no paid staff we're all volunteers um amazing. and and what's so amazing about that is i mean I, I, talking to some of my like uh, venture capital people when they talk about you know this like startup phase where things are super lean and super efficient and they're comparing that to kind of government bloat like you know and, and i come from more of this kind of lefty progressive thing but like within our organization because we're so you know we have like not much money in the bank shall we say and it's most mostly coming from our members um you know there's a lot of passion there and there's the, the, the beautiful thing about this nuclear advocacy world is there's just such smart intelligent yeah. people with such a diverse array of backgrounds and you know economics and you know running like we have a we have a, a former uh, uh systems operator like control room supervisor you know the guy who was like turning up this power plant dialing down that one keeping the whole system going well, you know we have um, obviously doctors engineers we've got we've got a lot of great expertise um and we've developed a lot of really really bold, strong talking points that the sector, the industry would never make. Um, and so being able to turn those into memos and briefs and present those to, you know, the two, I mean, I'd love to get to all the political parties because, you know, as we say, Canadians for nuclear energy, the best climate solutions belong in every party. Um, but it's, it's great being able to kind of see these ideas in um, from the back benches. And then all of a sudden find myself speaking to the minister of defense for, yeah. for my country and saying, yeah, I'll get you a memo next week um, on, on how this is relevant to you. Amazing. Uh, I mean, so you're really interacting at the absolute highest levels of government at this point. Um, it's unbelievable. You can tell us just a little bit story about at recently how they reached out to you or how they got a hold of you for this. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I didn't know this, but um, 
you know, we are a tier one nuclear country, so it does make sense. Um, the the two main political parties, the liberals and conservatives, I hate making kind of Canada to US comparisons. It's the Democrat Republican comparison doesn't really do it justice at all, but you know, they're party of the sort of center and a party of the center right, I'd say, not, not as extreme. Um, as our neighbors to the south, but uh, both of them have nuclear caucuses, um, you know, with us too. Yeah, okay. I, I, actually, I don't know if that's true, but I know that there's pro nuclear people on both sides. But are they organized as a caucus that meets every month to talk about nuclear issues? Uh, probably know. not. I don't actually, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm in DC, but I'm actually not that well versed. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was impressed by this. And I think they've gone, they've sort of gone moribund for a while and had like bursts of energy where they've been meeting more regularly. Um, but certainly there's, there's peaked interest. Um, and so there's a group of, you know, ranges between about, you know, 15 and 25, uh, I believe in each party that, that are part of these caucuses and interested and meet on a regular basis to discuss these issues. And, um, we'll be doing, you know, plant tours and things like that soon, which I'm really excited about. And, um, and you're going to be part of that. You're going to be leading those or you're going to be like, I definitely want to be, I want to, I want to be a part of it. I want to visit. I'm not, I'm not leading them. I don't have those kind of connections, but you know, I did do a, um, the, the tour of the of, of Bruce Power that I did was but even if you're not um, leading them in some ways you're going to be considered yeah, I, I gave leader. I gave a like key, people I are going to be key. asking you even just as yeah. this like outside person who's like not working for the power plant like hey Chris what should I think about this like yeah, if yeah. You're no I went I the the first tour that I that I did the first nuclear plant I toured was uh you know start big right start with the world's largest operating nuclear facility um <laughs> <laughs> ontario boy here um but it was with uh it was with labor unions and uh and our our left political party the the social democrat like new new democratic party uh who tend to be pretty skeptical of nuclear um because being a party of the left with a lot of roots and sort of anti-war activism and that boomer generation became sort of de facto anti-nuclear energy um, and so it was um, the nuclear power workers unions who I've been really reaching out to and building relationships with, um, again, speaking about that, you know, developing that critical mass and mobilizing that that sector of 76,000 people. Um, they were very interested in, in bringing in these, you know, politicians who have roots, you know, their political parties have roots in trades unionism and saying, hey, come have a look at the last bastion of, of healthy union culture of these jobs that were nostalgic for you know, the kind of manufacturing jobs of like the 50s, 60s, 70s, where, you know, you may, you could support a single family or you could, you could support a family on one, one wage, you can have a car, a house, you could send your kids to school, or if your kids wanted to come work at your work, from my experience, from what, what I've been able to research, it is kind of the last bastion of those kind of jobs, that kind of employment and those kind of vibrant, healthy communities uh, with a substantial tax base um, where there's jobs for everybody. Um, it's, because it's not just, you know, um, operators uh it's it's you know all the trades people it's you know the paramedics the fire they have a fire department on the site they've got all, all sorts of stuff right um and so you know being at that tour i gave a, a sort of a keynote to um to those those uh you know left-wing uh political party members but also there were a number of trade unions that were invited who are not nuclear and also tend to be quite anti-nuclear which is you know horrible but they learned so much and it was it was really amazing um seeing um, seeing eyes really open and jaws hit the floor, um, as people sort of really could identify with their values. And, you know, I, I made that, that, that sort of, uh, that line about the best, uh, you know, the best climate solutions or the best clean air solutions or the best just transition solutions belong in every party. But I really, I think that is something really unique about nuclear. I'm writing an op-ed right now uh, on that theme. Um, and, you know, we have the conservative party in Canada and I'm making the pitch that, you know, nuclear is the ultimate economic stimulus. Um, especially in Canada, 96% of our supply chain is here. We have independent economic analysis that demonstrates that every dollar you spend on Candu, you get a buck 40 back in GDP. Wow. Like there's nothing, there's nothing like that. And particularly when you start looking at the alternatives of buying, you know, polysilicon solar panels from China or wind turbines, looks like, it looks like Europe can't build oh, wait, 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 wait. wind turbines economically. But, but hold so, on. This is like the know. strongest argument then. Like I, I didn't even realize that, that there was this like, um, this like po positive, you know, economic feedback loop when it came to nuclear, plus you get the clean air yeah. benefits, plus you get like the long-term job security benefits, not just even like yeah. the short-term economic, like, yeah. okay, come on. Now it's almost, now it's almost too good to be true. I mean, I always knew it was too good to be true, but, or I know I always knew it wasn't too good to be true. It's just too good. But now it's like, like doubly, triply too good. So I hadn't even thought about that with your, with your, mm -hmm. your localized supply chain. That is ridiculous. I mean, and, it, and it's very, I mean, it was Noah, Noah Redberg who brought this to my attention, right? Just like how special Canada is as a, you know, pretty small country 
that developed a viable reactor design. There's, you know, we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of, of you know, attempts and, you know, at, at building these things. And we've ended up with what, four or five major, you know, pressurized water, boiling water reactors, et cetera. And like they can do the pressures, heavy water reactor. We invented that. We have it. We still run it. We're refurbishing it. Um, you know, and yes, and because we are a tier one nuclear nation with the richest uranium ores in the world, um, we own the whole supply chain. You know, we don't need to enrich it, but it, it's incredible. Um, yeah, that is so, wild. It's, so, that, it's so wild. So it's like, okay, so I remember back, you know, I, I recently found out that back in American politics, you know, there are politicians who ran where their primary campaign was run on this, like, let's go 100% nuclear. I think like JFK, maybe like maybe mm. even a few others. They're like, let's build 1,000 nuclear plants in America. Yeah. Like, that was the leading campaign slogan. So, I mean, do you see a future where like a head of state in Canada could run on that platform? You know, it, it's interesting at, at COP26 in Glasgow, our, our prime minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, was asked about nuclear energy. And he gave a very typical answer, which was, we're doing wind. He wasn't asked about wind. We're doing solar. He wasn't asked about solar. You know, <laughs> climate change is a big deal. Um, it's a big challenge. we got to have a lot of options. We've got to keep them on the table. And, you know, nuclear is on the table, probably, maybe, could sort of, should, maybe, oh, if. I hate that. You know, that was the answer. Oh, and that was the answer. And I mean, so when I was talking to, like, his colleagues, and again, you know, I, I don't come at this from a partisan angle. I mean, Robert Bryce, I think, says it really well, where he says, you know, I'm not a member of any of these parties. I'm a member of the disgusted party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all joking aside, I mean, you know, I do, I do, I'm able to, again, come in friendship to all, I have differences with, with all of these parties. You know, I'm a very particular person. I've never been happy in any sort of religion and any sort of ideologic formation, never been able to label myself politically. Um, I find it interesting. I think each of them have an, a, a, a distinct um, sort of moral set of taste buds that, that guide them. Um, but it's interesting being able to make that pitch. Like I was saying, the conservatives, it's, it's around economy. The, the liberals, I'd say it's you know, really around climate change and, and showing them you know, they, they are a party that's put in, in place a price on pollution, carbon tax. You know, they talk a big game and they're, they're I think, talking with the, the local MPs. They're genuinely uh, interested but there's not that kind of energy literacy. And, and I can't say I blame them because we just so energy literate as, as a society. Okay, but, but, you, but, but if you are like, and this, this is the kind of thing, like if you, if you do get interested in climate and policy, then you've got to spend a few years understanding energy and digging into it. And, and, but the, that's not been the culture. And we're not, we're not a political class of engineers and scientists because I think those folks just can't stand the kind of inertia of, of politics. So it, it ends up being a different sort of group of professions that, that, that enters into Western politics anyway. Um, but they're thirsty for it. They're genuinely hungry for it, genuinely interested. And I, I was expecting a lot of hostility because I had confronted their team member, right? Their minister of environment and climate change. Um, and it was a pretty edgy little you know, media hit with him in, in Glasgow. I think I embarrassed him. Um, and he would never have agreed to sit down for that kind of an interview, but just managed to catch him on the fly. Um, but, you know, again, I don't, I don't come trying to destroy their political party. I come bringing ideas to try and help them develop the best political poli uh, the, the best policies possible. And it's more being warmly received. Um, and, and especially it's, it's like folks who have not thought about it so deeply. Like if you try and make these arguments on like energy Twitter um, or with, within the nuclear sector, there's a real stark sense of what's possible and what's not, right? But because these politicians have not thought so deeply about these issues, they're really open. It was for me, I was like, this is this is really beautiful. Um, well, that's awesome. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, that's pretty amazing to hear that there's that opportunity. But you also dodged my question a little bit, just like you accused the politicians of. I want to hear it from you. Do you think that a head of state can run on a platform of 100 percent nuclear? No, not yet. Not yet. Of course not Why yet, not? Brett. Why not? But Why I mean, eventually. Why not. Why not? Don't you think so? Okay. Because like you went, you went to this whole like energy literacy thing, but I'll take a different stance because like, I don't think that like someone needed to, needs to be like a rocket scientist to say, Hey, let's go to the moon. Like, I think, mm -hmm. like, I think, mm -hmm. I think it is literally just the being bold part, having a grand vision part that resonates mm -hmm. with people. I actually don't even think it matters with that like vision actually is but if someone is willing to like 
like like like throw their reputation behind something with such like passionate conviction i think that would sway voters and it has been done before on nuclear heads of state have run on a hundred percent nuclear platform before and man wouldn't if education if energy literacy like was something that i mean obviously is something that needs to be done wouldn't that be the greatest opportunity like remember how like so like when Yang in America ran on this universal basic income, he came out mm -hmm. strong for it. Nobody knew what universal basic income was, yeah. but he yeah. was able to not, not only educate everybody, everyone's like, now where's my thousand bucks? Where's my thousand bucks, Yang? Like, mm -hmm. So he was able to not only educate, but he was able to even you know, shift the political dynamic to be more in favor of it. I, like I, be, I think, I'll put my opinion out there, I think someone could run a presidential or a prime minister campaign on 100% nuclear and use that as the opportunity to, to, to re-educate everyone on like what nuclear actually is. And I think they benefit from it politically. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I, I have to agree with you, the politicians that really craft their, their campaign carefully to, you know, we're going to win this election, we're going to meet people where they're at, we're going to develop a completely unimaginative policy around what people think is safe and want. No, it's, it's folks like Andrew Yang that bring these big, bold ideas and bring people along with them. You know, that's, that's what speaks to me personally. That's what I find interesting. And that's what's necessary because we need, we need change. Um, and there's a great Mark Twain quote that says, uh, this is more about needing to, to shift politicians, changing them every few years. <laughs> it's just shared on the side. It's not really relevant. It just came into my mind. But um, po politicians um, like diapers need to be changed regularly and for, <laughs> for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> but but in terms of, you know, that question of like, you know, we're going to go to the moon. I mean, that resonated because of the space race, right? Because of that anxiety that they were being over, 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 uh, overtaken by the Soviet Union. Um, and and so, look what the Soviet Union is doing with energy right now. Hmm, sounds like a great opportunity to say, yeah. let's go 100% nuclear. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great opportunity for Canada, certainly, to, to try and step into the, the vacuum of uh, the decimation of Rosatom and the decimation of, uh, you know, their, their fuel fabrication. You know, we're a, we're a, we're a tier one nuclear nation. We don't, we don't enrich uranium, but we could do, and we should. And, do, you guys and, think, do you guys think about exporting the Candus? Is that on the table? I mean, I mean it's been done, it, right? It's been done. I mean, China, Korea, Romania, uh, India, Argentina, obviously. I think, also. Argentina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can do can do um, needs to be uh, resuscitated. It's I mean, we are keeping our fleet alive with the exception of Pickering um, and Gentilly in Quebec um, with these refurbishments, which, you know, I, I like to shit on the West a lot in terms of nuclear, but I'm really coming to understand that Canada is actually decently positioned. You know, our, our the largest the largest infrastructure project in our country, twenty six billion dollars is refurbishing a, a good chunk of our can do fleet. And so we're building you know, we have heavy forging, we're building new steam generators, apparently, we're, we're banging out eight steam generators a year from one factory in Cambridge, Ontario, you know, where do they go? And where do they go to? Uh, those are going to Bruce, I believe. Oh, Bruce all and Bruce. Okay. I think all those ones are going to Bruce. Yeah, there's a lot okay. of steam generators per per uh, and Pickering's even more. It's like 12 steam generators per, <laughs> per reactor. Well, I mean, even better, um, but but I mean, I, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I remember when I was like learning about the preconditions of the Mesmer buildup in France, and I think it's the Chalouse plant that was banging out, um, you know, reactor pressure vessels. And they, I forget the numbers they were doing per year, but it wasn't that far off from what we're doing here. Um, and that's always been, you know, from again, this outsider, and I want to really bring and, and this beginner's mind and this humility, which I think is very much um, I owe to the world, given, you know, that I'm not an expert in these areas. But, you know, my sort of common sense vibes here is, you know, why can do is so important for Canada is that the West in its, you know, at its aborted renaissance of the early 2000s got obsessed with this idea that we were going to innovate and come up with a new fancy design, which is going to solve all our problems when we had a completely atrophied nuclear construction workforce, um, we're gonna go out on a limb and, and try something we've never done before, right? Whereas in Canada, because of these refurbishments, we're swapping out all the internals of our reactors. We may not be that good at pouring nuclear concrete and rebar, we'll find out about that. That, that stuff, you know, hopefully so we can bring some expertise I mean, to make that happen. Yeah. I mean, from what I hear, if you make a fuck up, it's a pretty big fuck up and you got to tear stuff back up. But yeah. you know, wow. all, all that all that aside, all that aside, Canada is very well situated um, to be a little bit conservative here, um, to build a reactor that we're intimately familiar with, both in 
operations and in refurbishment, which is, I think, a good chunk of that construction. And so to me, it's the lowest risk investment to make it, you know, for Canada. That being said, you know, I just spent um, a tw- at a 24 hour intensive with, uh, with uh, our friend Kyle of Calumets. Um, of Fermi Energy, yeah. and you know he's very sold on the the SMR model and more of the sort of like private sector um, model. Um, and you know it's it is interesting. Canada does have a huge opportunity being a first mover on you know this BWX three hundred. Um, there's interest in Europe and around the world to build more of these units, and we may be able to capture some of that supply chain because we were a first mover. Um, so what what I'm trying to convey to Canadian politicians is that there's there's a huge amount of opportunity here, but we need to bet big and be bold. We need to, you know, we need to signal with things like our green bond framework that we're serious about nuclear, that it's a safe place for private capital to come and stimulate this sector, our ultimate economic stimulus, um, to, you know, up our share of, of uh, you know, world uranium, to, um, to build CANDUs here, um, to build SMRs here, to export them. Um, we're actually in a, in a decent position, but it is going to take um, serious bold leadership and when trudeau is asked about nuclear at next year's cop he needs to come out swinging and say yeah. absolutely canada is a tier one nuclear nation we we achieved the greatest decarbonization uh in north american history with our interior coal phase out you know we offset a third of our emissions with our uranium that we mine we're doing more because we're helping europe become energy independent um, as they have committed to uh, eliminating russian energy imports you know canada is a, a small nation but we're, we're punching above our weight you know, and we're going to, we're going to help out our allies in Europe in this way. Like I, I, that's what I'm, that's, that's the kind of wind I'm trying to blow into the sails of these politicians. And I think, I think they're excited about it. And who, and who's carrying out those refurbishments right now? Um, yeah. I mean, so there's, there's four, uh, all the units at Darlington are being refurbished. So that's OPG. And then but, but um, who, like, who, which is the engineering firm that's actually doing the work. I, I'm sketching this, but BWXT is, is doing the steam generators in Cambridge. Okay, they're doing some, okay. But yeah, I wonder- uh, There's a huge, you know, there's a huge number of contractors that are involved, but- Okay, yeah, because I'm wondering, it's like, because if you can refurbish, that means you know every part inside and out of that can-do reactor, right? Which means that the engineering know-how, of like how to put these things together is out there sitting in the hands of like a private engineering firm or many private engineering firms in Canada. It's just like, come on. active. yeah, Yeah, and like, don't you want more business? Like, okay, so like, now say that you can build a bunch, you, you've done the refurbishment, you've gathered the expertise, you're clearly trusted yes. with, with nuclear regulators, with utilities. So now, you know, brag about that expertise, you know, and just start selling these things everywhere. And why <laughs> stop, and why stop refurbishing with just Darlington and Bruce, you know, and we're, we have a, yeah, we have yeah, a really exciting, like we have a very exciting report uh, we're about to, to drop on, uh, on Pickering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tell me what's going on Pickering. Cause this, this is infuriating. It should be. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so Pickering is uh, one of our crown jewels. We have three of them in Ontario. We have uh, the Bruce site, the Darlington site, and the Pickering site. Um, and these were built at a time when we um, really knew how to build nuclear well. And we had, we had this idea down that you, you pick a design, you standardize it, and you build a whole bunch of units on one site. So Pickering is eight reactors. Bar, uh, Bruce is eight reactors. Darlington is four. We were supposed to build another four. Um, and yeah, basically, um, Pickering, uh, eight, eight, uh, 550 megawatt, uh, candy reactors. Um, and, uh, the plan is to shut it all down 2024, 2025. It's been extended. It was supposed to be shut down in 2018, but I think the, the electricity operator, you know, and, and the, the new government that came in put their heads together and say, okay, this, this doesn't make any sense. There was a great, uh, Ontario Chamber of Commerce report that looked at this and, you know, there's 7,600 jobs, 3,000 direct, 4,600 indirect full-time equivalent jobs on the line, you know, huge tax base. Um, and obviously it, it's what gives us our climate leadership. Um, with this one plant closing, Canada will lose all of its emissions reductions progress it's made since 2005, right? Eight, eight megatons. We haven't made much progress again because of the oil sands and we haven't done a very good job as a country, but we're going to lose it all with the closure of one nuclear plant you know, it's, it's, it closing, it will add 1%, um, will, will increase our annual emissions by 1% as a whole country, just closing one piece of infrastructure, one plant, right. And, and, you know, to make it intelligible to the, the, the politicians, I tell them, you know, this plant, when it closes, the independent systems operator confirms it will be replaced almost entirely by natural gas, you know, not wind, not solar, uh, because, you know, you're swapping out, um, stable generation for something that's stable and reliable it'll be gas that's the equivalent of eight million transatlantic flights per year and that seems to get through to politicians because they fly a lot right to go back and forth to parliament and whatnot wow 
yeah, yeah, it's wild. I mean, it's it's uh, there's no excuse for closing it down. That's just too crazy. Especially so, I mean, the, the, you guys excuse, the excuses and, and it's, and it's interesting because I want to I want to like understand the decision makers and there's a lot of inertia to making these decisions yeah. and 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 the, the variables change and you know, it was around 2010 when they decided not, they had a plan. It was, you know, it's been approved. So we know it's technically possible. There's an EA that's been approved for it. Um, the regulators signed off on it to, so continue we know we, to, refer. to refurbish it, but, but OPG decided not to. And they did in an environment where climate concern wasn't as uh, intense, where natural gas was seen as a, you know, a pretty um, squeaky clean uh, transition fuel. I mean, certainly all the environmental groups were funded by natural gas at that point and singing its virtues and our own, uh, Ontario Clean Air Alliance uh, was lobbying not for nuclear, but for gas to replace coal in Ontario. Um, and the fracking revolution had started, so gas economics looked really good. Um, there was a plan to build another nuclear build at Darlington site. Um, so maybe you could say, well, this is an older reactor, we're going to close it down, open another spot. Um, these were some of the decisions that were at play then. Of course, facts on the ground have changed dramatically. Um, you know, gas has tripled in the States, and like, where's it going to go once? the U S is really focused on helping out its European allies get off sure, of, yeah. of Russian fuel. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, we weren't thinking so much about electrification back then. And the idea that we're going to need to double or triple our grid. So knocking yeah. 3,200 megawatts of reliable 90 plus percent capacity factor uh, generation off your grid, you know, as we talk about electrification, it's, it's a huge step backwards. And, you know, as great as the SMR program is, it's, we say it's one step forward for 10 steps backwards. You're adding 300 <laughs> megawatts and you're retiring 3000 megawatts um it's like it's like a concession prize i mean listen i love the smr stuff i mean we're involved mm -hmm. in it but it is a it is a it is like a kind of a concession if you know if that's like the whole nuclear policy of, of a country is like oh we're gonna we're, yeah. we're gonna just forget about the big ones and but oh but you nu we'll do just enough for you nuclear advocates to be happy we'll, we'll give you we'll give you some grants we'll give you a million dollars here and there you know, just yeah, just, get, just yeah. to keep the loudest voices the loudest nuclear scientists you know just to keep them paid off we'll, we'll let you work on some research projects that's that's cute like because that, that's really what it feels like it does yeah 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 especially when you when you you know if you're serious right and i always talk about it's it's like we're speeding towards a you know a brick wall of our climate commitments um, in a car with, with no brakes, um, you know, because the, the commitments that are, being accelerating. Made are, are accelerating. completely unrealistic. And, you know, we have this emissions reduction plan that the government put out. There's been 10 governments that have put out emission reduction plans. Um, nine have done so, so far, all have failed. This is the 10th and reading through it. It was, it was astounding. I mean, a, it's not, not a lot of money that's being promised and B there just seems to be this fundamental confusion of energy sources with energy carriers. And it's like, well, we're going to have a hydrogen economy. Um, and it's like, how, how are you going to make that hydrogen? You do realize that, you know, it's very energy intensive to make hydrogen, or we're going to use lots of carbon capture and storage. Well, you do realize that, that it takes a lot of energy to run the carbon capture machinery. And currently we run that by just burning more coal or more gas, right? Like this is fundamentally about switching out, replacing fossil fuel services, services, right? Heat, electricity, but also reliability, abundance, you know, dispatchability, et cetera. And we need to replace it with a better source of energy, a more thermodynamically viable source of energy, right? Um, we need to do that on at least a one-to-one -one basis, if not more, because, you know, things like carbon capture, things like, you know, hydrogen generation, um, these, yeah, these take more on. energy. It, it allows the renewable people who hate nuclear to just totally, you know, anytime somebody says, well, what about these flaws of renewables or those flaws of renewables? They say, oh, well, hydrogen. Oh, well, that, right. we'll, we'll capture. Oh, well, yeah, natural, ca natural gas plus capture. Oh, hydrogen. And they get to shut yeah. down the conversation immediately and totally yeah. instead of, you know, facing um, a harder conversation. You know, and I, I think there's also this element where you get to sound a lot more sophisticated and solve a lot more problems and do a lot more modeling when you're when you model something that's you know a, a, a rube goldberg machine right then just saying you know what yeah it's actually i mean it, this isn't simple and i don't you know you talked about building 25 buildings i mean let's be clear there were preconditions for the extraordinary build out say in france of those 45 reactor or 54 reactors in 15 years or the way that the chinese are, are looking like they're being able to build the, the wall on one so quickly I mean, that does take certain preconditions that takes an sure, I say more illustrative heavy practical. industry, yeah. Yeah. et cetera. Right. But I mean, certainly let's, let's get going on that. Let's get building that. Um, one of the, the, our current government slogans is hard things are hard. And it's like, well, the hard energy path is hard, but you know, we got to get back on it yeah. because, you know, I had a great conversation again with, uh, 
this wonderful Edgardo Sepulveda, the, my I call him my senior economics advisor. Oh, I listen to all those episodes. I mean, I listen to all your episodes. It's I like great. Oh, we, we have a great one dropping tonight. Um, oh, really? And it's just a beautiful exploration of, you know, the, what we call sort of like the lost Amory Lovins decades, right? Where, you know, there was organic growth within our grids, you know, 5% per year, and there was demand, demand, demand. And then you start, you start bumping up against, um, you know, things that are that are harder to electrify, right? Um, and things that are not as viable to electrify, right? Like, you know, a fossil fueled car, an ICE engine is a pretty incredible thing, incredible range, et cetera. Um, you know, heating, you know, from a, from a, a strict perspective, especially with resistance heating, electricity is not a great use for it. We can do it in places where we have insane abundance like France or, or Quebec with all of their hydro. Um, but because we followed the Amory Lovren's doctrine and we just stopped building new generation or actually stagnated or, or decreased, we've become incredibly ill-equipped for the electrification challenges that we face now, where it's more of an inorganic growth, where it's a policy-based growth of we're doing this for the climate imperative. Um, and we, we, you know, these politicians, um, they've grown up in that, in those lost Amory Lovren's decades, I guess we're going on like, shit, five decades, four or five decades now of that, you know, of these entire policymakers' lives. Um, they're not equipped with the, the, the tools and the, the policy capacities to even be imagining what's required um, for the buildup that we're talking about. Wow. Um, yeah. that's, and that's, that's staggering. Um, and so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring that through and without intimidating as well, because you know, I'm talking to real fiscal conservatives and I'm, I'm trying to make the play for, you know, if, if you believe that the government has a very limited role to play, um, Certainly, most people, even on you know the, the extreme sort of fiscal conservative right, still think that the government should be running the military and national defense. Um, but the way I'm trying to pitch it is that you know energy is and, and energy an security. Defense. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it is national defense, and it's well, also. Plus, I think I think the, your dollar in dollar forty out argument is just amazing for the fiscal conservatives, also, right? But what they what they're allergic to is the idea that that it's going to be bond spending. That you know, even yeah. though it is private yeah. capital, right? But the government is borrowing that and spending. It's a you know. It's not tax and spend, but it's borrow and spend. I mean, but what's the return it gives you? And, and the problem with our current green bond is that it just, it's a bag of sort of feel good things. What's, what can be funded? Um, they're not things that necessarily give you a great return. And, you know, one of the, one of the concepts that again, Edgardo um, helped me understand was this carbon abatement cost. Um, and it's this idea of, you know, how to get the most bang for decarbonization, decarbonization buck. And I think it was Reiner Kurtz. He appeared on, um, on uh, Robert Bryce's Power Hungry podcast, but he was looking at, you know, what's the carbon abatement cost for um, keeping uh, New England's electri- uh, nuclear fleet online? It was $25 a ton. What's the cost of putting up a utility solar farm? It was about $300 a ton. What's the cost of rooftop solar? $800 a ton. So we need to optimize that dollar, right? Particularly coming out of, you know, inflationary I- spending on, on COVID responses and things like that. If, we, if we're going to rein things in fiscally, yeah. government still needs to spend, but they need to do it incredibly wisely. And we should be running those numbers. Those are numbers you can actually plug into a basic calculation. I see. The carbon abatement cost, if I can paraphrase, is, is you're simply uh, trying to find a metric by which to, uh, to levelize. Like you're trying to find a common, a common, there's a lot of crazy inputs, but right. this is like a common metric that, you know, you can compare a variety of different energy sources. You can find well. the variables, plug them in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's, yeah. that's great. And so if I, you know, if I was designing that, that, um, you know, in what we call, I guess, what is it like a, a technologically um, neutral, there's a better word for it, um, agnostic kind of frame. It's like, well, let's just plug in those numbers and see, you know, and obviously there's tons of ways to manipulate numbers and there's LCOE and well, things like that. Yeah. But carbon abatement cost is, is uh, I think, a pretty... I mean, again, there's assumptions that will go into how those numbers play out. You know, there's lies, damn lies and statistics, and then there's modeling and other things as well. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the core message to, for, for these more fiscally conservative politicians is, you know, this is an area of vital national interest. As Isaac Orr says, energy is a secret ingredient in everything. You know, we're going to be we're going to be having eating a lot of pain here with, you know, food prices that are already uh, higher than the the 2008 uh, economic crash. You know, which yeah, stabilized well, much of the Middle East. I mean, we're that's what I'm worried hard about. times and high prices. And that, that's what I'm, wor- I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried that um, with all these forces that you just mentioned, that um, that at some point people will just say, oh well, climate change isn't our isn't our problem now because we've yeah. got we've got food prices to deal with we've got inflation to deal hey we got inflation people you know oh we're heading into a new recession oh people and you want me to worry about climate change like that, yeah. that argument you know people were thinking that the you know with this whole like oh we have 12 years remember that whole like we have 12 years to like really yeah. right the ship I, like I, I don't i think they think that oh if that number keeps counting down 
people are just going to get more and more urgent and then finally it'll kick things into gear. But what I think is going to happen as that number cuts down, other world forces are just going to become more of an issue. And the people are just because, oh, this climate change thing, they'll, they'll find another way to rationalize around it. Oh, it wasn't that bad. Or, oh, it's too difficult. Or, oh, the right. next generation will be living inside a virtual reality, so they don't need the environment anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like some, but I can't, I can't predict it. I can't predict right. it. I don't think anyone can predict it. But in five years or in 10 years, it'll seem inevitable that people, oh, here are the reasons why they just gave up on climate change. You, you know what I'm saying? Here, yeah. I mean, here's some thoughts I have. I think that we've been living a very easy decade. I mean, it's not been easy for everybody, but um, you know, capital has been very cheap. Energy has been extraordinarily cheap. And we've had the luxury um, to, to be climate concerned. And unfortunately, we've had the luxury to really fuck up our climate response and not do things in a very effective yeah. manner. Yeah. Um, that's that's going to change dramatically, as you're saying. There's other imperatives that come into play. Um, and we see that, you know, in less developed countries, climate is not their organizing principle around which they're steering government policy or economic yeah. activity for very real, for very real and understandable reasons. But, you know, as, as someone who's a real climate hawk, um, it's been interesting coming to terms with the fact that really getting energy wrong on the within a very short term, we're talking years to a decade, it's proximate effects, you know, it, it, the human suffering, the deaths, and we're going to be seeing some of that, I think, because of the food stresses of a yeah. badly managed uh, approach to energy are, are greater than climate change in the short term, right? Like we're not talking 2200 here, we're talking 2030. If we really, I mean, if we, and we, if we really to follow the prescriptions of these very simplistic thinkers um, who basically equate fossil fuels to cigarettes without understanding that we truly live in a fossil fuel civilization. I mean, look at Václav Smil, look at fertilizer, steel and cement, you know, those are all critically yeah. dependent on fossil fuels. If you don't have those ingredients, you don't have a civilization, you have yeah. mass starvation. And we're literally, we're, we're flirting with that. We're seeing that with the way that fertilizer, fertilizer prices are going. I mean, geopolitics aren't helping this at all, but just the energy crisis alone. Uh, we had Doomberg on uh, two episodes ago. Um, he wrote, a, or they wrote a great piece, uh, you know, Farmers on the Brink, which goes into this perfect storm of factors. Most of them are related to botched energy policy and a really simplistic way of thinking about fossil fuels. And for me, the takeaway is just like, it is a crime to be burning natural gas as baseload electricity. You're burning food. <laughs> right yeah I, I mean i think alex epstein says that right i mean you know yeah or oil i mean gas oil, is the food of yeah 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 so yeah 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 so i mean I, I i share that concern and i think there's also the potential for real sort of populist backlash against these measures and you know i mentioned our, our government um really prides itself on sort of putting a price on pollution on carbon taxes. And I have, to, I have to think through this more. And I know James Hansen, you know, is a sort of uh, carbon fee and dividend guy as well. To me, it feels, um, and again, I say this with humility, it's not someone who's extraordinarily well versed in this, but my, my kind of gut reaction, my common sense reaction here is that it feels very sort of consumer politics, you know, like, well, they'll see the prices a bit high at the gas station, and they're going to do these calculations and think, hey, maybe next year I should get a Tesla and da, 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 da. And it's very slow moving. It's very sort of granular, every person making their own. It's very market based, obviously, right. But when you when you're faced with the kind of challenges that we are and the response that's required, it's going to take, you know, a much higher level of organization than just individual consumer choices. So you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm inspired by I think what what is possible. Um, you know, it's particularly within nuclear at this at this moment in time, like it's extraordinary seeing the UK with uh, starting this, I'm not sure if it's a crown corporation, but a, a government entity, a vehicle to facilitate nuclear builds, great British nuclear. Oh, yeah, um, no, it's exciting. Or, I was just on know, the phone with the British government a couple of days ago discussing this very thing. I remember well, you, you, you tell you tell that to me because I, I just read a few stories on it. And I've been I've been very excited about it. But I mean, what do you what do you understand about it? Um, it's still being developed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can tell you right now, it's uh, they're, they're still working out the exact specifics. Um, but uh, the urgency is high. Like I, I yeah. from what I heard, and they're like they're very serious. Like this is like right now. I feel like it's just a name, but it's a name with a lot of political capital and a lot of political momentum behind it. Mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't have the details of what the exact like, you know, like government or corporate structure is going to be, they are deadly serious about this. Um, yeah, what is it called? It's like the Great British Bake Off, but uh, I guess Great, great, British, <laughs> great British Nuclear. Great, 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 great British Nuclear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, it's coming, exciting. A, exciting. it's coming from a conservative government, right? But I think it shows you that when the rubber meets the road and when, you know, energy security 
uh, when energy, when there's an energy crisis, um, that we will find a way, right? And there's so many excuses made for why we're not taking, you know, bolder action on climate well, and more uh, bolder action with nuclear. Um, and and once there's a real rationale there, um, you see things happen quickly. And I, I think we're at the verge of seeing that happening across the world. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's so funny. Let, let, let me just continue on this on this uh, Great British uh, nuclear point for a second because I was going to um, critique or at least offer a bridge be uh, between what you were saying and how I feel about things when it comes to you know, what's going to allow for like the greatest scale up of nuclear possible. Um, and and I think the Great British nuclear actually might be the perfect compromise because I, I actually think that market forces can be used more effectively to like create huge scalable global change. And I think your point, if I understand it correctly, was, no, no, no you need some like, you know, the, like a, the power of a big government and the direction and like the, the tools and the, and the force and the money and the infrastructure behind that to make that change. And I actually think that's what this great British nuclear thing might be. It might be like the synthesis. love child of those two things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. going to be the power, the vision, the tools of the government, but it's going to be enabling uh, private uh, market actors to, 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 um, to actually implement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I as you know, it, it's this whole thing of, uh, you know, as you learn more, you're scaling the mountain, and the mountain just gets higher and higher, the more you the more complexity you read into it. And, you know, hopefully, the path you take is one of just greater and greater humility, despite gathering expertise, right. Um, and so I find myself, you know, looking back at positions I held six months or a year ago, and being thinking just how incredibly naive I was then and yeah. how naive I still am now, right. And so I mean, yeah. I have my biases that I bring into this. Um, but I find myself more and more open to, um, again, shedding, shedding tribal affiliations and just trying to figure out what the hell works and what is pragmatic and what is possible as well. Because certainly yeah. within, my, within my sort of political origins, a lot of it is, you know, make believe um, and, and, and fantasy play, to be honest, in terms of the left, the political left. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I call it live action role play a lot of the time, right? Like oh, yeah. 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 Seriously. Um, Okay, uh, I also want to hear about um, your moves as, um, I mean, what, do you have a name for yourself? Like, what do you call yourself right now? An activist, an advocate, a thought leader? Let's call you thought, I'm just going to pick it. I'm going to say a nuclear thought leader. All right. Um, All right. Okay, as a nuclear thought leader, uh, obviously, you know, Canada is your home and, and you're gaining, you know, a huge amount of traction uh, politically there. Um, how are you? Do you, do you have ambitions to, to do you have, okay, maybe you have ambitions, but do you have like a game plan to leverage your success in Canada uh, at the global, uh, at a global scale? Like, are you, are you going to almost like create like a, like a, uh, like a Chris Kiefer playbook of what worked in Canada and start chopping that around or, and, and then what are you going to, are you going to create a bunch of like a little mini Chris Kiefer's around the world? Or are you going to go around the world? Uh, what's I've, got, I've got one one mini Chris Kiefer, my my boy, you know, but he'll he'll be quite different than me, I'm sure. But um, yeah, you know, something that I think is 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 really really vital um, is is a tool to really you know speed up the education process for advocates for politicians as well, right? And and um, and that's this this idea of having a set of uh, a set of talking points essentially, right? Um, meticulously crafted. Um, you know, probably tweetable or Twitter length. And I'm drawing on some of the work of Alex Epstein here, but taking it in, a, in an obviously a very different direction. But again, I, I borrow, uh, I think Robert Bryce says this amateurs, uh, amateurs borrow professional steel. So I'll steal, steal that. And, you know, with my own, uh, my own imperatives and my, the differences that I have from, from uh, Mr. Epstein. Um, but uh, this idea of, of having these carefully crafted talking points, um, which are hyperlinked to you know, a background memo that really helps you understand that talking point in a lot of detail. So that when you deliver that talking point, mm. you, you have the streamlined way of, of having some degree of expertise and the basis oh, I love for it. That. I love and that. That's an, the background that's an, memo for a talking point. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe you hyperlink that memo even to some primary literature, but like that's an enormous amount of work and yeah. it takes really skilled people to pull it off. I've got some really, really skilled people. Um, shout outs to, to Dylan Moon in particular, uh, my, my, uh, I shouldn't say my, the decoupled producer um, and, uh, and really real jack of all trades. But, you know, we, we've been working on these talking points for, for um, the podcast. And, you know, I, I put Dylan onto so many different tasks and he does an excellent job, but it's, it's, you know, it's pretty ADHD in terms of, I've got this great idea. We should do this. We've got that good idea. And, you know, it's limited human resources being a pretty small little media enterprise, but we got to really put that to work um, that concept with uh, the briefings and memos that we made for politicians. Um, 
and so that's that's something I'm really excited about. And and there's um I remember hearing about this some time ago. There's a group called the Albert Einstein Institute, and I think they're kind of CIA affiliated. Um, they've been involved a lot in the colored revolutions, um, like the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon, and I think I think maybe Maidan even. Um, uh, but it, it, they have a kind of playbook, a civil disobedience playbook um, that they distribute to activists in countries with really you know repressive uh, political um, scenarios. Um, and it's it's a kind of playbook, as you were sort of discussing there, right? And that would include, say, if you're in a country where um, certain songs or music are banned, right? This, it, some of the earlier iterations, I think, were written in like the 80s or 90s when you still had those big, um, not Walkmans, what do you call those things? Like boomboxes, right? right? So, you, yeah, you <laughs> not a record player. No, no, like it's a cassette player, right? But you, okay, you, like, like, put, the, yeah. <laughs> you put the prohibited song on that and you'd, you'd throw it in a garbage can on the street with a song on it. And it would play and just the act of playing a, uh, you know, a band song in a repressive country has a, has a huge impact, right? Or I believe it was in Syria at the beginning of, uh, you know, in the Arab Spring there. Um, there's a huge fountain outside of the um, outside of the uh, like internal internal security, internal police building and some activists threw red dye into it. So it was a fountain of blood. Right. And so it's, it's this, it's this, the, what I'm, what I'm getting at is this concept here, right? A playbook. Um, you know, they took sort of best practices in terms of, um, in terms of civil disobedience and partic with particular focus on what works well within authoritarian uh, countries. Um, and they were able to arm activists to essentially overthrow those countries. Um, and that happened to align quite nicely with the American imperial interest. And it was, you know, obviously uh, done in a, in a, in a pretty prescribed way, but all, all that um, aside, um, these are the things that sort of percolate through to me. So this idea of, of these kind of talking points, and this is not, this is not propaganda, right? This is not, uh, this is stuff that's drawing on very, very high quality evidence. So it's, it's a big project. It's going to take a lot of work. If anyone's listening that uh, wants to help fund that, um, <laughs> get in touch. But um, you know, these, these are the kind of tools when you, when you talk about sort of what, what do I feel like I have to offer more broadly? I mean, I, I come with a lot of humility because there's already a ton of people um, doing great work internationally and we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, there's of course the fabulous standard for nuclear network, um, which I think ties together almost all of those advocates in a, in a great big happy family. And we're all constantly learning and interchanging, but yeah, what we, an impressive group that is. I'm, really? I'm another, like, you know, just like I sit back and I'm like a huge admiration of what you're doing. Um, as I see like the, the news trickle in from the whole stand up for nuclear crowd, I, I just sit back and just like all, I mean, it's like the favorite part of my night when I see some of those texts flying and see how much everyone's accomplished i'm just like yeah. these people like someone i can't wait till i mean yes people are i, I guarantee people are gonna start writing books you know now but when someone writes the like the the like the encyclopedia of what happened you know i think it's gonna just be awesome to read these stories yeah absolutely absolutely yeah no it's you know we're, we're like all these little grains of sand on a beach that are that are piling up into something um, but it, 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 I, I talk about it, you know, in terms of um, looking at the, you know, when you're in like an old school, like karate martial arts dojo or something, and there's like the scrolls of the various, <laughs> um, you know, they're not called gurus, whatever, the sensei is you know, down through time. And yeah, it's like, interesting like, thing. In, yeah like Star Wars, they have the old books that the Jedi is read out of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, the, I don't know, like the, the, the nuclear sensei is like, I, I think I... I'm sure there's there's figures that predate this. I'm thinking about um, William Siri at the you know the Sierra Club uh, uh, president who who basically made Diablo Canyon happen, right? Had the rational discussions um, to preserve um, another area of scenic beauty and and to to make a pragmatic decision about building Diablo Canyon, which ended up to be you know a great environmental choice for California. Um, you know William Siri, folks like James Lovelock, the independent scientist and inventor. Um, who, you know, very early on saw the case for nuclear influence folks like Stuart Brand, who in turn influenced, you know, Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus. Who in turn influenced us. Awesome. It's like, oh. right, right. And, and, but it's interesting because it started, I think, as, you know, as some very lone voices um, and, and intellectuals and theorists and philosophers. Um, and then they had a lot of courage to come out and sacrifice okay. reputation and, and really pay a heavy price. Like thinking of folks like Mark Linus as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, but they, and they, they sort of created a, a, a space for others to sort of flourish and bloom and for a movement to come together. And, and I think we're really seeing that transition from um, thought leaders and think tanks to an actual grassroots movement, chapters, organizations forming. Um, you know, again, it's a David and Goliath battle and, and we are the Davids, um, despite all of the perceptions of, you know, you guys, you know, because of the passion people see and how effective we are, they're like, you must be, you know, just getting bankrolled by the nuclear industry. And it's just such a funny irony 
because like the yeah. nuclear industry is is uh you know yeah, I, I think uh, Stanford nuclear it. folks saved, saved they saved the Illinois plants and uh basically got nothing but trouble for doing it from the nuclear industry right like, yeah if, if people actually know I mean it is like yeah it's very frustrating because even sometimes in like political discourse like on very popular podcasts I'll hear like even on Joe Rogan or something you know which I'm a huge fan of that podcast I heard someone say something about you know how oh the nuclear advocates you know how it's just, oh, so equal. You've got like your nuclear bros against your environmental people and like, oh, the nuclear right, people right. must need so much money. And then like to be living this life and seeing like my friends, like like struggle financially, but like not have any money, like sacrificing, like making a lot of money, working for some big yeah. company, putting all their personal money into this nuclear advocacy, being turned away by the nuclear companies, have seen the nuclear companies invest money that's almost anti-nuclear, um, and then to hear that crit criticism in the public discourse, like, I don't know. I, I don't want to say it frustrates me. I mean, it, it definitely frustrates me. It saddens me. But it also makes me think that, like, there's almost no point in having the conversation. Of, like, there's almost no point in trying to articulate that to, like, the public audience. Because clearly, they, they're just swayed by the other argument, like, too easily. Mm -hmm. and, and this brings me back to, like, my, like my take on, on, like, what we need to do. Like, we just, uh, to me, it's like, okay, well, we just need to make nuclear cheap and accessible and, you know, and then build a shit ton of it and actually not care. Like, I don't know, my, you tell me if you think I'm off on this, but like my, and maybe I'm just a little disenchanted, but my philosophy is we only need enough public support to get, you know, whatever that quote unquote social license is such that early efforts to build more nuclear don't get shut down. And if you can get those early efforts to build more nuclear working in a cost-effective, time-effective way, then you create this flywheel of market forces to take over the rest. And like, you never even have to win everyone over. You can let people lie about you, but just build, a, you know, build 10,000 gigawatts. Just do it. You, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, it's interesting. When I was in Glasgow at, at COP26, um, you know, we participated in some of the climate marches. Um, and I remember like people coming up, who's paying you? And I was, I was, you know, in my doctor garb and I'd pull up my medical ID and I'd be like, Medicare. <laughs> I'm paid by the Ontario Health Insurance Program. That's I love it. Well, well, well um, you actually, out of everyone, have the most, oh God, I hate to say credible, but like the e most easily to understand because you have this full-time job as a doctor in Canada, you, you know, it's like you're unimpeachable in terms of your credentials more so. Well, than and I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I am full-time, but I give up shifts every once in a while, like this, this trip to Ottawa. I mean, it cost me to do this for right, sure. Right, right, right. Yes. I didn't mean sure. to, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, but it's no, the, I mean you're one of the people who sacrificed, like the, when I was just ranting about all of my friends who have sacrificed so much, I mean, you're one of those people too, like no doubt. Yeah. I mean, luckily it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice because I just, I find it so interesting and, and stimulating, but God, yes, I would love for, you know, team David to be much better resourced uh, because ultimately like we have, we have a world to win, right? Um, we have a climate to win. We have, you know, human prosperity to win. Um, but there was something else. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of kind of a, like a, this virtuous cycle, like as I've been in, interacting with politicians in the media. Um, and again, it's based on this sort of influencer model and this kind of paleo psychology, but you know, as these these bold talking points and memo uh, memos start to you know infiltrate through the back benches and work their way up um, through the political parties and politicians start feeling a little more confident in what they're saying. As as the media, you know, are are it's been amazing. I've I've been on probably fifteen or twenty talk radio shows in the last few months. Um, you know, we're starting to see really um, really good print media coverage from newspapers which are traditionally anti-nuclear and we're starting to see the shift like you remember you know in the early 2000s when they had a, a discussion about climate change you know journalism is all about being fair and balanced so they bring on you know the climate change denier and the climate scientist and you know it'd be balanced right and there's been i think that that sense of needing to do that in the media up until very recently of like okay we brought on dr Kiefer, so we've got to bring on someone who's anti-nuclear but i think the anti-nuclear folks like their their credibility is sort of coming to be seen as similar to that of, of the climate denialists. They're just, they're so out of sync with, with the science. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's really exciting to see, but there's this virtuous cycle is interplay, right. That I, that I see, you know, the momentum that's building where politicians are speaking more boldly, the public starting to listen up, the media is um, starting to speak more intelligently about nuclear. These messages are, you know, I think Dan, Dan uh, uh, Carling of, of hardcore history, he talks about like intellectual contagion. 
Um, and, and these ideas are, are, I mean, that's a terrible phrase to use. I'm, I'm just kicking myself as a doctor in the COVID pandemic talking about it that way. But, but there is a certain sort of like, let's stick to virtuous cycle. There's a virtuous yeah, yeah, cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you're talking about. Take I'm foot out of mouth. mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, wow. That's okay. exciting times, Brett. It's exciting times. I, I would not have imagined uh, being in this this position personally or, you know, just globally in terms of all of the exciting things that are happening. Um, it, it gives one optimism in what are otherwise pretty dark times. Um, and um, yeah, we just got to all work on being the best humans we can because I, I, I have a cognitive bias to sometimes um, towards doom, towards, you know, thinking that COVID is going to be a lot worse than it ended up being or um, you know, a variety of other issues. And so I'm always trying to check that, you know, do a little, um, a little cognitive check. Uh, oh, so you're a, natural, I gotta say you're a natural pessimist, do you think? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm a natural optimist. Um, yeah. Though. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. You're, you're so, okay. So are you like training yourself to think the other way? Sometimes I have to train myself, like from a business perspective, I have to like right. watch my own cognitive biases. Right. Right. Sure, like, exactly. I, yeah. Risk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm on, I'm on the other on the other side. I need to do that. But I, I've folks like, uh, you know, in that last podcast I did with Doomberg on this, uh, the perfect, the perfect storm affecting world agriculture. I mean, it's, it's concerning and things don't get more serious than food shortages, right? Oh, I know. They really don't. I know so, that's all. That's always been my biggest. I mean, I started giving talks about this three years ago when I first got invited to like get on like the climate change talking circuit. My, you know, my biggest concern, I, like, I don't buy into the whole like, you know, we're all going to like be underwater type thing. Like that's, I mean, maybe, but yeah, I mean, like eventually, sure. But right, like right. my biggest concern has always been a disruption to precipitation patterns. Like, and that can actually happen in the short term because it's more, because that it already happens. It's just a matter of like the frequency, which it happens. Right. Right. So, and you could see that affecting um, billions of people. Um, but then like, you know, I had some like recent optimism when you know, I have some friends that are in the like robotic agriculture space and they're like, Brett, I get that you're a little concerned about food shortages, but let me just tell you like what we're doing from like a productivity per acre perspective. It's like wild, like just wow. in the US, we can feed the whole world, you know? The, so like they tell me this stuff, but then, you know, things start shifting again. And, right. um, and like we have what's going on with the like Ukraine and the Russia wheat crisis. And, and, and I listened to your episode um, with Doomberg. Is it Doomberg yeah. or Doomberg? Doom, doom, D O O. Doom, Doomberg, yeah. yeah. And and I was also like a little, so now I gotta go back to my agriculture friends and, and right. see what they think. But yeah, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, it's it's great, great having smart friends to kind of bounce this all off of. Um and and you know, again, for someone who's a non-expert in that area like me to to be able to take in a, a variety of different perspectives. Um yeah, definitely, definitely um hungry people become angry people pretty quickly. And, and sure. I think the again, the those those proximate impacts of climate change are, are so much more the social political ones and um and, and not only the younger people it's also just um it's just horrifying that we can let people starve given the amount of abundance that's available to us as modern society right. and, I think and that's it's that's really the, yeah. disgusting that we can even like as a society that we can even allow for anyone across the planet to starve ever like this hat like i don't understand why this isn't the i mean we've done a pretty good job i think overall when you see how much calories we're able to deliver around the world but we can do even better and that should just be like okay can i can i riff with you for a second so we got this like un that's like totally defunct why don't we have like a u like united nations for and i know that the un has like these sustainable these 17 target goals or whatever but like i don't understand why we don't have like an individual worldwide agency you know 180 countries get together form this agency and it's just all about like distributing calories across the world okay like we're going to make like mission number one make sure nobody starves and everyone has clean drinking water and then like okay but like let's let's seriously focus on this and let, let's make sure it happens and then after that okay now let's move on to like okay everyone has like basic medicine and like to me it seems like that should be a, like a shared mission that we can bring together the world's countries for mm -hmm. I mean, those are easy values to get behind, but I, I am seeing that optimist bias in you uh, shining through <laughs> quite bright there, Brad. I mean, for me, for me, I think the stakes are, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about this uh, before as well, but this, this idea of kind of innovate or die, right? Yeah. And the climate catastrophists um, are, are very capable of, of making um, their worst predictions come true um, if we follow their, their policy proposals, which are anti-innovation, which are, you know, this romantic idea that we can go back to a simpler, better time you know, burn that biomass, 
uh, farm using only methods, you know, that are 200 years old and just watch what's going to happen. And we're seeing that. I mean, look what happened with Sri Lanka when they, you know, uh, on a whim, uh, shut off all synthetic inputs to their agricultural system. Oh, I didn't know this happened. Oh, it's wild. We're doing, we're doing a show on it any day now, but, um, yeah, no, yeah, check into that. But you know, like ultimately, yes, you know, we, we are going to need to innovate. There's always going to be new problems that will arise. We're going to create new problems with the technologies that we develop. We're going to have to solve them with new technology. It's a wheel that is forever rotating forward. And we really did the inertia behind that, the billions of people that depend on, on that innovation and that process, uh, you know, are there. Um, so, so that, that's this, this ideologic battle of ideas again, um, which, which we really need to win. Um, and it's just such a shame spending such a large amount of my time in a rear guard action fighting, you know, the anti-nuclear people or the anti-biotech people, um, and really these incredibly well-resourced environmental NGOs, um, you know, worth, you know, with global annual operating budgets in the billions and all they do is campaign. All they do is engage in this battle of ideas and what's, what's team David doing. We're doing what we can, but you know, on very, very limited resources and the strength of our arguments is what carries us. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to, you know, more organizations coming forward, better resources flowing in, um, you know, because there's, there's incredible uh, human capacity. Um, there's really, really smart people, um, you know, making these, these arguments. Um, and I'm, I'm just really hoping to see more of them being able to move into this as a career because um, there's, there's a world to win. Yeah, it'd be pretty amazing. Well, okay, we're approaching two hours. This is going to be my yeah. longest podcast ever. Is there anything <laughs> else that we should cover before... No, I think, I think that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a record for me as well, Brett. But <laughs> Okay, well, Chris, um, as always, just amazing, 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 amazing to watch what you've done. Uh, and um, yeah, let's, let's keep collaborating. Let's, let's, you know, let's keep seeing what happens over the next few months, over the next year. Uh, this, this, is, this is a wild journey. And I'm just, I'm just so glad to have people like you on board for it. Yeah, yeah well, thanks. Thanks, man. It's, it's uh... Like I say, you've, you've, uh, you've been an inspiration from day one and uh, it's, it's awesome collaborating with you and learning from you and, uh, and getting that optimistic heterodoxy, uh, which you're saying is actually just the most like vanilla stuff ever, right? <laughs> Let's just build the shit we don't want to build. <laughs> and initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.